a big night for the Phoenix Mercury on and off the court. I've got Bay Area News Group's Alex Simon here to talk about it. You're on Locked On Women's Basketball. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Good morning and welcome to the day after draft day, 2022. I am Howard Magdal, founder editor of The Next and host of Locked On Women's Basketball. And we are here with our daily show. It is Tuesday, April 12th. Alex Simon of Bay Area News Group writes about the Phoenix Mercury over at The Next is with us. Alex, how you doing? <laughs> I am doing well. It is uh, even earlier for me than it is for you out here on the West Coast. But you know what? The early bird gets the worm or whatever cliche we want to use. And uh, we're here, we're awake, we're alive, and we're rolling. Have you people considered using the correct time zone, just switching to Eastern time zone and making that happen? You know, given that the sun is still barely out and we're recording this pre-7 a.m. West Coast time, you know, I, yeah. I mean, it would be a little weird if it, this was 10 a.m. I got I guess that's true. I guess that's true. I just I, I something I'd like you to consider purely for my own uh, viewing options as it comes to things like the Mercury Dames late at night, Seattle Storm and, you know, the Pac-12. Pac-12 women's basketball is as enjoyable to watch as virtually any conference in the country. Hey, look, anytime you want to get on our wave here in Arizona and just not do daylight savings time, it would be appreciated for everybody, too. So. I, I, I'm open to the conversation. I'll leave it that way. You know, let's pay some bills and uh, talk about some companies here before we get into a conversation that is more complicated than your typical draft night. You and I have covered Mercury draft nights uh, in the past. Uh, but let's start with Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, lead reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the Major League Baseball season. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Something that I always appreciate about Bet Online is the fact that they have odds for NCAA women's basketball, WNBA, not because I'm looking to wager, but because that equality matters. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Locked on Women's Basketball is also brought to you by Built Bar. This is the time of year a lot of people have given up on their New Year's resolutions, but maybe that's just because they haven't bought themselves some Built Bars. You have to try the puffs. They are delicious. Uh, the ad copy says yummy, and I'm not prepared to disagree. Cinnamon churro, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie. It's all good. It's made with real chocolate, not pretend chocolate. So go to built.com and use our promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, for 15% off. These bars have about 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only 4 grams of net carbs. Built.com gives you the opportunity to choose your flavors, and they add more all the time. Again, LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order at built.com. As always, tell them Grandma Myrna sent you. Alex Simon, we're here talking about an unconventional night in Phoenix Mercury history for reasons that I know we'd all prefer were not the case. But take me through just the top of the broadcast, and we heard from ESPN's Holly Rowe about some new information as it relates to Brittany Griner, who is currently being detained in Russia. Yeah, Holly Rowe on the show, pretty much right at the start of the show, reported that the league and the Mercury have been in discussion kind of about Brittany Griner's situation as it relates to the basketball court itself. Obviously, everything that's been very focused on getting Griner home still remains the focus, and that is the number one priority, I think, for everybody in and around the WNBA. Mm -hmm. But as we're hitting kind of the end of two full months of her detainment here, the season's about to start, and there has to be at least some resolution on the court. Rose reporting is that the league and the Mercury were in discussions about possible roster relief is the term that Rowe used. Mm -hmm. um, within that, Griner herself will get her full salary and she won't be suspended, which a league source confirmed to me in the next last night after the draft as well. So 
part of the di dynamic here that's a little tricky is that there is a precedent for this be that's happened in the league. Mm -hmm. But it's a little difficult precedent of sorts, right? Yeah, it's a little difficult to say within this specific situation. So the precedent was in 2019, Brianna Stewart tore her Achilles during a Euro League game and was going to miss the entire season. The Storm had multiple injuries on their roster around that same time, including Sue Bird, who ended up missing, I believe, the entire 2019 season as well. Um, so within that, the league allowed the storm to suspend Stewart's contract, but then the league itself chose to help pay for Stewart's contract at the time. It was still on the rookie pay scale. So it was a little more than $65,000, but now for Griner, part of the tricky part is she makes the full super max. She's making 227,000 plus here. And so if they suspended it, it would allow the mercury a lot of flexibility. They might even be able to get up to 12 players but within that, you don't really want to suspend a player's contract who ostensibly could return and maybe even would want to get back on the court. And that's part of this massive unknown that everybody is dealing with across the league here, but especially in Phoenix, where no one knows what, what could happen and whether even if Griner showed up tomorrow in the United States, whether she would be at any point physically or mentally ready to get back on the court during 2022. You know, it's interesting. There's a lot of times I, I remember when Stewart was given that dispensation, there was grumbling around the league, uh, not because anybody had anything against Brianna Stewart, but just the sense that uh, the rules were not being uniformly applied. I, I don't necessarily get the same impression as it relates to Brittany Griner. I, I just think the situation is so singular that the league figuring out some independent rules as they relate here. I mean, look, you know, God willing, we're not talking about this scenario where you better create a precedent for players who are subsequently detained in Russia. You know, just yeah, a, ru not a Russian a Russian detainment clause into a right. CBA doesn't seem like it should be necessary. Correct. Even though this is currently happening right now, you hope it's a one of one. Exactly. And so from that perspective, I, I think it does make it a little bit easier just from a rules perspective to try and figure out where you can create something. And Kathy Andelbert would presumably have the support of the lead to be able to go ahead and do it. But, you know, as you wrote, you are talking about a Phoenix Mercury roster that was already shorthanded because of the rules that we do have. Can you take me through, you know, just how difficult that's going to be? Well, the Mercury have very much optimized their roster to go for the home run of home runs in 2022. Yeah. They've got three players on super max deals in Griner herself, but also Skylar Diggins, Smith and Diana Taurasi, Taurasi and Diggins, Taurasi and Griner, excuse me, are in the final year of their contracts this year. Yeah. They only really have like two players under contract for next season at this point, which is one more year of Diggins Smith and the recently signed Diamond to Shields, who has a second year to her deal. They've also added Tina Charles on a one-year deal. Pretty much their entire roster was built to be, we're going for it all right now, and we'll figure it out next year after next year. And within that, one of the big things was that Kia Nurse, who was a restricted free agent and tore her ACL during the WNBA semifinals last year, took basically her qualifying offer to come back to Phoenix. Now, you can kind of wonder why she would be willing to do that, but she is rehabbing. It seems like her market dried up because of the ACL tear, mm -hmm. but she's going to be on this roster and there's not really a guarantee that she's going to be able to play at all. It'll be less than 12 months by the time the WNBA season even ends, even though nurse is extremely confident. And I will emphasize, she is extremely confident that she will be back on the court well before then. Mm -hmm. It's still something that the Mercury even last year just went through with Bria Hartley and it took a few months longer than they anticipated then to get her on the court. So they were already going to be carrying 10. Griner means they're going to be under 10. So even if the relief is just you can sign whoever you want to have 10 full rostered players without it being a hardship exception, exception it's going to get tricky. And within that, you know, again, if you don't want to suspend Griner and what that means for the cap, because, you know, maybe she does come back and wants to play. How do you manage that and allow the Mercury a world in which they can put people on the roster within the cap that they don't really have any space for otherwise? Their roster was basically built with, I think, $200 worth of space if right. their final two spots were veteran minimum players. So mm -hmm. they could use veterans, but 
only on the minimum and with just the slightest of slight wiggle rooms. Two hundred dollars. I, I mean, you know, I have so many feelings about Kia Nurse alone, right? You know, betting against her is a fool's errand, and it always has been. At the same time, these injuries and recoveries from them are not an issue of willpower. It's not a question of whether Kia Nurse has the will to put in the work and return. It's just a question of what the body will allow or not allow. And there's furthermore, there's this: there's the fact that Kia Nurse clearly played hurt when she was in New York clearly was playing on an ankle that was not 100%. And her shooting suffered mightily because of it, not because Tia Nurse was not putting in the work, not because Tia Nurse is a bad shooter, but because she was compromised and was simply looking to push through it. And so from the perspective of thinking about Tia Nurse's long-term career and something that should be very productive in the WNBA as long as she chooses to play, you know, she's still in her mid-20s. So, you know, having her rush back is something that is a red flag for me. But all of what you're describing makes sense, right? When you've got Diana Tarazi and the sand and the hourglass nearing its end, whatever that ends up being. I mean, I know old people can dream too, as Tarazi herself said in 144, but you need to, like, this is like the writ large Jim Pittman uh, plan as what it's always been, like dating back to our hypo soup stage, right? Like you, you have Griner, you have Tarazi, and then you figure out the rest. And the team always changes. There's always different things you do yeah. around it. But when you've got Griner and Tarazi, who are going to be, you know, we're going to visit them, uh, their plats in Springfield uh, one of these days, that, you, you know, you, you make sure you maximize what you're getting from them. But this obviously is tremendously complicated. It's tremendously complicated. And I don't really know what you do about it. I don't think you can plan to have Brittany Griner in uniform for all the reasons we talked about, which is different than rolling her out, but you cannot plan to have her there either, right? And on top of that, this roster, even with Griner, was going to be extremely top-heavy, but Tarasi herself has had two seasons out of the last three severely impacted by injuries. Yeah. And nobody in their right mind, even though Tarasi herself got through it, like she was playing through some serious injuries here at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And it's tough to even know the long-term ramifications of that. That's something I'm looking forward to finding out come training camp starting. It's just what was the offseason like for her as she kind of was coming back from the end of her first ever loss in the WNBA finals, yeah. but also playing through injuries to get to that point. So this roster was already going to be kind of have to be held together very delicately mm -hmm. because of the injury history there. It is definitely an older roster than it was last year when you add somebody like Tina Charles into the mix. Now it might not be so much with Griner, unfortunately not able to be ready at least for the start of the season. But it's certainly a roster that at its peak can be the greatest team ever assembled in the WNBA. Mm. However, if everybody doesn't stay on the floor, who knows what happens? And they've, they've mortgaged a lot of their future to make that happen, by the way. They don't have their first or second round picks in 2023 after not having any here in 2022. And while they did have an extra third round pick here in 2022 via Atlanta, it's rare to see third round picks make rosters. Mm -hmm. That said, and I think this is a good jumping off point, they did add two post players to a team that now has a deficiency in the post. They did. Sure. And, I, and I want to talk about that. I, I do, just to your last point, I, I want to know what Vanessa Nygaard is going to have to say about minutes restrictions and limitations. I don't just mean on, you know, player X or player Y in a specific scenario, but, you know, whether we're talking about I mean, something Nikki Collin did extremely well with the Atlanta Dream a couple of years ago of keeping everybody under 30 minutes. It's something that Cheryl Reeve talks about doing. And then uh, she, you know, it, it's almost like, like an addict is the way she talks about it, the way she falls back into, well, look, I, I, I need to chill out there for a certain amount of time. And so, you know, that is a difficult thing to do. But if anybody has a roster built in a way that we, we need to see minutes held down, especially in a compressed season, it is, it is the Phoenix Mercury, don't you see? And that was the exact reason why they were so thrilled to add Tina Charles was that they knew that they were kind of running Brittany Griner and Brianna Turner, their two big posts, into the ground toward the end of last season. And they could do it and do it exceptionally well. But playing them 35 minutes in the regular season certainly wasn't sustainable, let alone however many minutes you try to play them in the postseason. 
in which it was getting way up there at certain points. The idea of bringing Charles in was to say, look, we can lessen the load on all three of our really key and important post players. Obviously, what they do with Diggin Smith and Tarasi was going to be a little more fluid. They have a bit of guard and wing depth that they're decent with. We'll see how they feel about it coming into this team now. But the thought with adding Charles in the first place was we can lighten the load just slightly on our very important players and try to just make it be that we're not so dependent on them night in and night out. Obviously well, now that's an unknown of all unknowns. Right. For sure. But you know, what we do know of course is who they selected. And for instance, at 26, uh, they selected uh, academic underachiever, Maya Dodson. If you could take me through <laughs> What uh, what they think they have in my I, I kid, of course, my graduated with an engineering degree from Stanford in grad school at Notre Dame. Uh, she is far better student than I will ever be. Same here, my friend. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny because of the fact that there's currently two former Notre Dame fighting Irish on the Mercury roster who have a head coach that graduated from Stanford. So yeah. that will certainly be a, an allegiance question. But I think they really like what Dodson was able to provide. And what I find interesting is that Dodson seemingly was ready to stay in college for another season mm -hmm. and now got drafted into the pros with one of the very tight 36 spots that you aren't sure if those players even make the roster. But there was a lot more players than 36 who were trying to be selected in the WNBA draft. So for Dodson to go from, I didn't want to leave college, but the NCAA said no to, oh, I'm a WNBA draft pick. That has to be a pretty quick kind of one, two of the week here for her within the last couple of weeks. But I think what they get from her is a player who actually, funny enough, Jim Pittman said reminds them a lot of Brianna Turner in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, a very rangy and athletic defender. She's dealt with foot injuries at several points, and that mm -hmm. really hampered her career at Stanford. Um but it seems like she was able to kind of get over those and be a really solid contributor on this upstart Notre Dame team. And especially as one of the few kind of older and more veteran players on a team that was led by a lot of freshmen, Dodson had a huge role there that I think could translate into being a good fit within a specific role in the WNBA if she's able to make this roster. And a part of making this roster is that we don't know how many spaces they'll even have for people to make now as right. part of that whole unknown still. I mean, that's the part that, that I'm, I'm smiling at because it's just, you know, does she have a chance to do it? It's very hard to be able to even diagnose this. Presumably this is something the lead and the Mercury are gonna have to resolve ASAP because otherwise it's a competitive disadvantage to Jim Pittman who can't figure out what he's, what he's able to do uh, come into training camp. And the same is true, of course, with their other late pick is Macy Williams. And I just want to highlight about Williams. Cause you talked a little bit about, she's only six foot two. And so you have that downside of, you know, it, what does the size allow her to be at the next level? Uh, she was not uh, a stretch five in any real sense at IUPUI, but she shot 63.8% from the field, 63.8%. And she was atop the stout, everyone who played IUPUI. So, I'm interested. Yes, yes, she is undersized comparatively for bids at the WNBA level. But I just wonder, you know, she's not going to be double and triple teamed the way she was at IUPUI. It's very interesting. And especially when a player wins their conference player of the year four times, I believe it's only happened three other times other than Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually a sign that this player is, like you said, the top of the scout and has been the top of the scout and to still produce given all of that kind of shows, I guess, the elite level talent. And especially to me, when the lights were shining brightest, and this is an IUPUI team that, if I'm not mistaken, was going to make their first NCAA tournament in 2020 when COVID happened. That's correct. But then COVID canceled that tournament that they were finally able to actually play in the NCAA tournament, led by Williams in her senior and final season. And she was able to be very productive, even against Oklahoma, in a mm -hmm. game that the Jaguars almost pulled off an upset of the host Sooners in. So if you like I, it, kind I, of I will say, and I love Oklahoma and I love what Jenny Branchick is, is building over there, but this is not, that was not a big Oklahoma team. You can't say that, you mm -hmm. know, oh, she did it against, you know, your, your typical big 12 bids inside. This is the team that gave up 61 points to AOK Lee, but that caveat aside, a big deal that, on Oklahoma's home court is a big deal. But also that's not a big Williams for being a, 
big player inside either at right. six foot two. So that it wasn't like she was exploiting a size difference like Lee was in the big game against Oklahoma earlier this year. Very she true. was maybe more equal in size there and was still able to be productive. And look, no matter what, a third round pick in the WNBA has a very low chance to make a roster. But if you're a player right now that is a post player, and this goes even for training camp signees, maybe the Mercury look in adding another player or two because you can carry up to 15 in training camp. Mm -hmm. They currently are at 15 with Griner on the roster. So whether players stay overseas would mean they have even less players. They do have a couple still playing in Europe in different spots. So there's an opportunity for them to add a few more players here in the coming days on training camp rosters. If I'm a post player, for as much as you don't wish for the situation to happen, that still is an opportunity for you. And so for Christina Nigwe, who has played three years in the WNBA, was a first-round pick, has already signed a training camp deal with the Mercury to join, there's roster potential here that, especially with the unknown, look, if you're a player, you just got to come in and ha have a good camp, and you might make your way onto a roster no matter where you came from, no matter what your draft pick or lack thereof was. It does just reiterate for me, and I asked Kathy Andelbert about this yesterday afternoon, but just the fact that the rosters are built in such a way in this league, you know, to have 12, but it's really 11, but often it's 10. And then it's got to drop to below 10 before you can add people that there's no injured list to speak of before you even get into anything like a practice squad, uh, let alone something like a G league. It, it is fundamentally, I, I'd be hard pressed to believe that it is a financial win. For the lead, you know, given how little, relatively speaking, the expense would be to be able to carry folks on a practice roster, to be able to have an injured list compared to how difficult it is to add people in season. Uh, it, it's got to be such a negligible difference uh, that the lead, I just absolutely think, has to look at this independent of expansion, just has to look at the way in which the roster rules work over the course of the regular season. And look, the Mercury have been a team that have been playing pretty late, almost as long as I've followed them and covered them over the last four or five years yeah. between high post tubes and the next. So they are a team I think who would immensely benefit from a practice squad and expanded roster to allow two or three more players. Now they might turn that and just keep dumping money into their superstars and just take people as cheap as they can get otherwise, because mm -hmm. that has been their MO basically since Diana Taurasi got to this point and especially mm -hmm. to keep Diana after 2015. So we had lost you momentarily, but you were talking about the years in which the Phoenix Mercury have had to battle with less than a full roster. Yeah, I, I mean, it's really four straight years where 2019 Diana plays only six games all season long. 2020, after Griner decided she needed to leave the bubble and the team allowed her to do that, they carried her on the roster for it after the first 10 games. Last year, they had Tarasi in and out of the lineup a bunch, and on top of that, Bria Hartley missed almost all of the regular season before returning late, but they carried her on the roster. And now this year they're going to be carrying Kia nurse on the roster too. So this mm. could be their fourth straight season where they even take a roster spot up for somebody who is ostensibly not able to contribute on the actual court for them beyond a very marginal amount of games. And so they are absolutely a team who would love to expand the roster in some way, shape or form, even just for depth purposes. You know, I, and I hear all that. I just would say it's not unique to the Mercury. This is a lead wide issue that I think needs addressing. And so hopefully uh, maybe the extremes of the Mercury situation helps make it happen. So I'm looking forward to seeing more about this. Alex Simon of Bay Area News Group. Alex Simon, my friend for life. It's so good to chat with you. Thank you for all your insights on this team and in general. I hope you get some sleep soon. Anytime and every time. I'm always happy to come talk with you, Howard. Our Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs>